Good evening. Tonight we're going to be talking about Voices of a Revolution. The leaders, the thinkers, the motivators, the people who changed our nation and created where you live today. So go ahead and get out a sheet of paper. It should be in your English notebook notes. And this is the information you need to know. I'm going to go through the slides. You can stop, pause this, do whatever you need to do in between. You are responsible for all of this information on the slide. We will talk about it in class on tomorrow. This period of time was known as the Age of Enlightenment. We already know that through um, our study of the Puritans and the Puritan religion, that religion and government were linked and they were joined in a way in which if there was a moral law that was violated, you had also broken a real state government law. When the Age of Enlightenment came, you saw that first real split and shift from religion being the motivation of everything to putting religion in its particular place and allowing science to think for itself. So as you look, the writers and thinkers of this time valued reason over faith. This is very key. So they weren't worried about the afterlife and whatever you did here that would take you to heaven. They believed instead in looking at the power of reason and science to further human progress. So the people of this time are those people who we can thank them for scientific invention. This was that time when they no longer had to feel like they had to get permission from the church to experiment. Politics, politics, politics. It was the age of politics. Remember the colonies now 13 in measure and there was a little bit portion of Canada that Britain also owned were really all royal subjects of the great union and that union was that of Britain. King George III was the king in which the United States separated from Britain. So here are the things that sparked the issue and the changes. There was the French Indian War and you're going to study it in American history so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it but you just need to know that when Britain went to war with France over Canada basically what happened was wars cost a lot of money and there was a lot of debt so King George and Parliament thought that they needed to create a way to end the debt what way to do it let's tax those around us including those in the colonies and that leads you to the Stamp Act the Townshend Act the T Act and the Coercive Act and all the acts kind of matched together. First there was a stamp act and there was a series of stamps placed on all kinds of goods and when they placed a stamp on those goods you had to pay extra tax. The colonists were angry and revolted because here was the thing they created the raw goods. So they grew the cotton, shipped it to England, England then turned it in their factories, those in, in England and their factories, turned it into cloth and then sent it back to the Americas as cloth and then tax them for it. So obviously, you know, not fair. So once that type of thing happened, people who did the stamp acts, they were, their stores were burnt down or sometimes they are beaten to death. Okay, they repealed the stamp act. So that's okay, we'll give you a different version of an act and then came the Townshed Act. And with the Townshed Act came the fact that now we're going to tax tea and lead and paints and and ink and iron, a whole lot of daily goods. And again, they're mad at the fact that you're taxing us without representation. Finally, there is the Tea Act, and you've heard of the great Boston Tea Party, and that was a protest that they had in the Massachusetts and the Boston Bay, I believe that's what it's called, where they dressed up as Native Americans, boarded ships, and dumped all the tea in the water. Well, that, of course, led to Britain being furious about it. That's fine. We'll get back at you. They dissolved the Massachusetts legislature and created what they call the Coercive Acts, in which the citizens, the citizens of the colonies were not allowed to group together other than going to church to create political meetings and any kind of insurrection. So that kind of tells you now that the tension between the two countries was not happy and that the colonists, not really thinking of independence, they were thinking of, we just want our rights. So now let's lead to the first united meeting. 
the first Continental Congress, took place in Philadelphia in September of 1774. Remember, the Declaration of Independence was signed <clears throat> in 1776. With that, they were trying to figure out, let's create a document, let's create a petition in which we send to King George and we ask him to hear our issues and give us a chance. In the meantime, in between time, the information comes back to them that he doesn't listen to them and that they're being traitors. Meanwhile, in Massachusetts, and this is what's key, in Massachusetts, the British government actually had their soldiers there. The colonies of Georgia or Florida or, um, by the way, it wasn't Florida, I'm sorry, South Carolina, North Carolina, they didn't really have troops, so they didn't feel the same tension that the colonists in Massachusetts felt because the colonists in Massachusetts were really speaking their mind, and so did the other New England colonies at that time. That's what they felt. So then there was an insurrection in, on April 19, 1775, in which we call that term the shot heard around the world. They don't even know who fired the shot first. They don't know if it was British soldiers. They don't know if it was American soldiers. It doesn't matter. That is what literally kicked off the Revolutionary War. Now, as we watch John Adams, you'll see more of this, and that's a good thing, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time there. But what it did lead to is an interesting conundrum that politics speeches and pamphlets became a part of literature. So here are some of the famous oratists and writers of the day and kind of the things that they're famous for. So you have James Otis, he's of the Mass of Massachusetts legislature and his saying was taxation without representation is tyranny. It's very interesting. Somebody should go look up what is written on Washington DC's um, license plates and get back to me. Patrick Henry of Virginia, he also said either you give me liberty or you give me death because I have the right to be free. Thomas Paine, he was the author of Common Sense and these were political pamphlets and they would just print them off of a printing press and this is how people got the information and so his his opinions and political propaganda for lack of a better word is what helped unite the colonists under this one umbrella. Then of course you have Ben Franklin and he is from Pennsylvania and he wrote the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin and Poor Richard's Almanac, both of which document his life and his thinking and his common sense ability to approach a problem. And then we have Thomas Jefferson and he was the main framer of the Declaration of Independence. He also helped frame the Constitution. He actually helped write a lot of things he was an inventor, an interesting note, the father of the University of Virginia. He actually willed the, um, the land that started the school. And he's such a really interesting person, and we're obviously going to talk about him again. So here's some more authors that we need to look at. Cultural authors. In other words, they're not political, but you need to know who they are. Joel, Joel Barlow, excuse me, he's a Yale graduate, and he was a poet. Phyllis Wheatley probably the most famous poet at the time and she happened to be an African-American slave and her famous poem was to his excellency and is a poem in honor of George Washington then you have Michael Guillaume Crevcour excuse me I tend to say de Crevcour and he first coined the phrase the melting pot he was the first person to say that America was the great melting pot so you want to keep that in your mind it's a good nugget because we'll come back to that and we might discuss later on is America really a melting pot or is it like a set of puzzle pieces put together to create this nation and his book was called letters to an American farmer you also have Olada Equiano and he was an ex-slave and he wrote the narrative of, of his life one of the first slave narratives and um, what he did is he um, Basically, in England, this book was so well received that they actually banished slavery based on some of these books. Irony here, you have an American government fighting for freedom, but it's just for freedom of those who were not slaves. And we're going to watch it in the movie. You're going to see some really interesting conversations about that. And then lastly, we have Noah Webster. You remember hearing of Webster's Dictionary? He is the first person to create an American dictionary and in this dictionary, he represented and helped coin what American English was, which is very different than British English. 
All right, leaders of this little baby nation. Yes, I know I called it a baby nation because that's what it was. It was basically cradle size. Lots of things they had to do. So you have George Washington. You guys know this. He's the first general. He was the general of the Continental Cong Congressional Army before they became the United States of America. And then that's basically he was the general of both of those things. And then he was also the first president. And it was a natural progression. People were going to attach themselves to him for that reason. You have John Adams. He was the second president. And he was one of the framers of the Declaration of Independence. We're going to watch his life. And one of the things to note as this documentary or mini series that we're going to watch, it basically the information comes from the letters between him and his wife. And Abigail Adams is probably one of the forerunners to feminist rights and having a voice and being able to b debate with your husband. So she's awesome woman and we're going to see a whole lot more about her. But that's why I like this because we actually get to see a view of the Revolutionary War from real people not just kind of what we have prettied up and painted with fireworks and red, white, and blue. Let, next you have Thomas Jefferson. We already talked about him. He's the third president and again a framer of the Declaration of Independence. You have Benjamin Franklin. I already talked about him, but here's who is key. He is a consummate diplomat. He was all about peacekeeping and figuring out the middle road. So he was our first diplomat to Paris and France and he was also an, amb an ambassador excuse me, in Britain. And that's all we have for now. You've got your notes. If you want to pay attention, you can read in your book. I've got the page numbers there. And we'll see you tomorrow.